So, um, thanks for coming into this session. Uh, I see a lot of uh, yeah, familiar and new faces here, and it's great to be able to put a name to a face to a lot of the guys I email and uh, don't really get that visual with you guys. So uh, thank you again to Tony and uh, David for uh, putting on the X World and uh, allowing us to come here and present. I think that's uh, exceptional. And again, it's great to be here. So just two things about housekeeping itself. Uh, the presentation will be made available uh, through the XWorld page at the end of this, so um, you'll have the slide deck if you're uh, at the end of it. And if you have any questions, please hold until the end of the session itself so we can get through the material. Um, and let's start. All right, so just a quick agenda. Um, there will be a brief introduction about the APAC support team, uh, a Jamf Nation update, specifically on the initiatives that we're uh, taking to make it easier for our customers to engage and provide feedback to us. And then there'll be a technical deep dive on databases and logging. So presenting is uh, myself, Barry Mack, Regional Support Manager, and Rob DeSofano, Support Engineer. Um, so just a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name's Barry. I uh, previously worked at the University of Technology Sydney, right here. It's my old stomping ground. So I see a couple of guys at the back there who know who I am, what I do, or what I did. So I was the uh, Mac admin back in the day. Uh, we used uh, Casper Suite to you know, help with uh, managing and everything. And you know, we had obviously life before Casper where we were using you know, rack mounted X serves, um, tools such as our workgroup manager, MCX preferences, directory services, and so forth. So you know, Casper had made it a lot more easier for us. And I think the guys at the back can attest to that. I'll let Rob um, introduce himself once he's up here. And, um, Let's start. So, APAC team. We're a small but high performing team of six servicing uh, the whole of APAC itself. You know, our team has a great mix of, mixture of uh, experience in both education and commercial verticals. And each member of a support team brings in different skill sets to the team itself. So, how many of the audience is a customer of Jamf? Ooh, all right, there's a fair few guys. Cool. So. All the guys who just put their hands up, how many of you guys have logged a support ticket in the past? Cool. Fair, fair amount as well. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, then you would have had some sort of interaction with Jam support, uh, be it by phone, email, or, or WebEx. Uh, but I'm guessing you probably you haven't seen us before. We're kind of like, you know, it's not a glamorous job in support. You don't really see us. You hear of us whispers. Well, let's meet the rest of the team. <clears throat> in addition to Rob and myself, uh, we have four technical support specialists, signed off with Gaurav Amatya, Hayden Shara, Matt Taylor, who you probably would have heard of uh, just previously in the lightning talk, and our newest addition, Jamie Hook. Is that you, Jamie? Uh, yeah, yeah. So she just joined us from uh, New Zealand. And finally, we have uh, Melissa Antoine, who's our international customer success specialist. Um, So, relentless commitment to helping our customers succeed with the Apple platform. Yeah, what does it mean? It's something that all the jams you do every single day of the week. So, be it from our great sales team, DevOps, professional services, uh, education services, all the way through the support. That's what we do every single day. But what does it specifically mean for support? So, yeah, we find and build solutions that may or may not exist regardless of our direct affiliation with our product or services, we ensure that all our customers have a path to success. You know, we also work and collaborate with our partners uh, to, so that they, our customers get the best catered solutions as well. So all in all, we're here to help. That's what we do. So yeah, don't be shy. Come see us. Send us an email. Give us a call. We're around. So where are we located in the world? Sydney, Australia. Netherlands, Amsterdam, and Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Those are our support hubs. So our support department currently is about 122 strong. So you know that when you log a support ticket with us, you have access to the greatest minds of draft support. And 
And because of where our support hubs are located in Sydney, Amsterdam, and Eau Claire, we naturally have a follow the sun support model. And that starts on Monday morning at 9 a.m. and wraps up at 7 p.m. in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. So what's the best method to get a hold of support? You can now, you can now actually uh, log a case with Jaff Nation. I don't know if you guys know that. Some do, some don't. I'll talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about this afterwards. You can obviously email us, email us and give us a call on the support number, 1800. Having said that, if it's anything urgent that falls out of our support hours, please give us a call. It'll get routed to one of our support hubs in the air, around the world. Who here uses Jamf Nation? Cool, cool. All right, good, good, good to see. What do you guys use it for? Everything, all right, cool, cool, yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, community-driven forum. Yeah, it's a place where you get your assets, your activation code and installers. So as um, Crisco and uh, Jamie mentioned previously, we now have a team that looks after Jamf Nation itself. And you know, they're constantly making enhancements and improvements uh, every day. So you know, what have we been up to? What have we been doing for the last three months, four months, five months? Well, here's a bit of an update. So we've, got, we've now got a support portal, which you can access through jamfnation.jamfsoftware.com. So if you actually log in, click on more, scroll down, and you'll see it there, Jamf support, they'll get you there. Alternatively, you can go straight to support.jamfsoftware.com. And that's how it looks like right now. So it's a centralized location for all the cases that you've logged. Yeah, you, you have the ability to retrieve information on previously logged cases, and gone are the days when you've had to dig through your inbox looking for that specific email, you know, trying to reopen a case that could have been a month old or three months old where you're seeing it again, or trying to look for the actual solution or the steps that were you know, given to you, provided to you, that actually fixed the issue that you're now seeing again. That can happen too. Is this helpful, guys? Yeah? Cool, cool. Case management. You guys have any pace, you know, pain points with case management? Making sure that all your emails in one location with that case, with all that information, maybe uh, uploading large files such as logs, screenshots, multiple log files. Yeah. So we've made improvements there as well. You have the ability to reopen cases through Jaff Nation. You can view the statuses of the cases itself and also upload upload large attachments. Solution summary. So this is new, and this is something I'm really excited about. Why? Yeah, it's a great way for our customers to recap on what actually occurred through the, throughout the case itself. And we introduced it uh, earlier this year, and it also ties in well with our uh, Jamf values and even the AUC values of, uh, and in the spirit of sharing our knowledge and empowerment. Yeah. That's what we do here. We, we like to help our end users so that they can help themselves. So some of the information that's provided. <laughs> I like that. Thanks. Breaks the ice. Awesome. Yeah, solution provided there. So we have our, our issue summary itself. So it's a short description of the difficulties experienced. Uh, there may or may not be a root cause, depending on the nature of the, uh, the core or the case itself. And the MVP, solution summary. So that's where the information is located. So if you have a look on the board, uh, in this particular instance, we're just asking for information about Fireball. Yeah? And there's a solution summary up there. Next one, customer satisfaction survey. Again, this was introduced earlier this year. And it's a pretty important update. You know, um, <clears throat> it's another new channel of uh, communication for you guys to give us direct feedback. Yeah, um, yeah, at the end of every single case that's closed, you get sent a customer satisfaction survey which you can provide feedback on the level of satisfaction, you know, ranging on, not at all, to completely. And we track the, uh, this internally as a CSAT score itself. So, and uh, with the introduction of the CSAT score earlier this year, uh, customer satisfaction surveys, we've re received about over 2,000 responses. So you know, I'm pretty proud about the figure itself uh, for the support department globally. And that, Right now, it's sitting at 93% customer satisfaction. So that's, that's a pretty good figure, I reckon. 
Now, these metrics are monitored quite closely and taken seriously too. So we encourage all our customers to you know, provide feedback as that's one of the ways to help, J help Jamf improve on our product and services. Who's heard about Jamf support live chat? Can I get a raise of hands? Oh, oh. Oh, there's a few. OK. Well, that's interesting, because uh, we've never actually publicly spoken about it. This is the first time. So yeah, I didn't expect many hands up at all. And uh, <clears throat> even though we haven't advertised it, we've actually had some of our customers engage us through it. And uh, it's an alternative method to engage with support. And that's how it looks like from a customer viewpoint. And depending on the nature of the case, or the chat, I should say. The case is logged automatically. And then through there, it will get funneled into either an email, phone call, or WebEx. So it's another method for you, method for you guys to get a hold of us, yeah? And the feedback so far has been pretty damn awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, that about wraps up my uh, portion of the session itself. And uh, now it's time on for the technical deep dive and the fun session. Hi, right, Rob. Thanks, Gary. All right, so that's an interesting GIF. Uh, I'm going to skip that one now. So um, my name's Rob. Um, uh, I've been in IT for about eight years now professionally as a systems trainer, um, an Apple certified technician, and a service desk manager. Um, I've been at Jamp for about a year and a half now, so that's my uh, quick introduction. All right, so you may have noticed the title of the, um, the session is called Avoiding Icebergs. Um, I'm going to take two different approaches, so it's going to be avoiding the iceberg and what happens when we ultimately hit that iceberg, because look, we can't avoid everything. So first we're going to discuss what we do once we, we hit that iceberg. Um, Look, there are several logs that we utilize when troubleshooting the JSS and enrolled clients. Each can be extremely useful in helping determine what is wrong in an environment. During this session, we'll briefly touch upon these logs and scenarios where each are useful. I'll also run through iOS console logs, common database issues, plus some tools to help us troubleshoot and avoid the iceberg. The purpose of this presentation is to help you effectively troubleshoot your own environment know some common, common causes for issues, and also ensure you have access to the right information during a sport interaction with Jamf. I'll even throw in a cheeky pop quiz to keep you on your toes. So uh, let's get started with some logs. All right, first up, uh, who's seen this one before? Yeah, a few hands, that's good. Uh, so this one basically contains information regarding the server-side activities um, of the web app and or database. Um, as such, getting the JSS log is useful in almost every situation. Um, it's invaluable for troubleshooting things such as Apple push notification service, uh, database, and stability issues. Essentially, if we're touching the web app at any point or trying to, we should get one of these logs. And I'm just going to fix something up before I proceed. Cool. OK. Next up, Catalina log. So uh, who's seen this one? Yeah, cool. Good. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> All right, so uh, this one basically uh, contains information about our Tomcat server operations. Um, it's useful for troubleshooting thread pool errors, SSL certificate issues, or an unreliable Tomcat service. So um, think Tomcat's not starting, stopping, crashing, all that sort of stuff. So uh, think Tomcat, think Catalina. Cool. Uh, next up, the install log. So uh, this is a local log you'll find on your client device. Um, Jamf logs are used primarily for troubleshooting specific client interactions with the JSS. Um, it logs things such as policy, distribution point, and management history. Um, if we have policies failing to complete or the client has stopped checking in, Jamf log is the first place we should look. Um, a good rule of thumb, if the issue is associated with functionality that the Jamf binary is used to perform, for example, running a Jamf policy command, we should check the Jamf log. Uh, so the install logs, uh, this one captures the history of package installations on a client. Um, generally used for troubleshooting package failures, but it can also extend into Apple software updates, um, enrollment issues, either via QuickAd or a device enrollment program. Um, so this log combined with the Jamf log that I just discussed uh, is helpful for package deployment and enrollment issues. 
All right, so now it's the system log. So basically it contains the history of uh, system activity on our clients. Um, problems involving configuration profiles, push notifications, JSS connectivity, uh, certificates, it can all be investigated here. Um, most of the time we should be interested in getting the system log from the client as a, a complement to the other information. So the, the Jamf log and the system log sort of go hand in hand with uh, isolating, correlating issues. Um, because the system log isn't usually inclusive of third party binary information such as the Jamf binary. Uh, so generally speaking, system log is used for deep diving where the previously mentioned logs do not provide enough information. So um, that was a quick run through some logs. Um, I'm gonna do a quick pop quiz. You guys like pop quizzes, right? Well, too bad. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanna show you're all still awake, uh, soaking as much information as possible. Uh, I know the topic of logging is not exactly the most exciting to present, um, but it'll definitely help in the event of a sticky JSS situation. So um, I'm also giving out some swag as prizes. I think Barry's gonna run around and, so this will sort of like give you incentive to, to I guess, Help me out here. <laughs> All right, so first up, um, where can I find the Jamf software server log on a Mac hosted JSS? Just raise your hand if you, yeah, Cameron. Um, almost. All right, no, I don't know who to give it to. <laughs> to Look, you. you're both good. You're both good? Cool, we're gonna run out of swag real quick. Yeah, I was about to say that. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so Tomcat isn't starting. Where do I look? All right. Let's raise our hands and I'll pick the. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Catalina log. Yeah. All right. Right on. Cool. All right. There you go. All right. Next up, um, something I can expect to find in the Jamf log. <laughs> I, I like it. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Uh, is that is that swag worthy? Uh, um, raise your hands. Yes. Like a policy, right? Policy failure. I think uh, I think that other one was uh, swag worthy as well. Cool, um, I'd also accept things like uh, the client stopped checking in or you couldn't mount a distribution point. Um, oh, we've got one more. So what are three useful logs located on our OS X clients? Um, you have to answer all three. I'm gonna go down this way because I haven't, haven't yet. Uh, bar log, jamf.log, bar log, info.log, bar log system. Beautiful. Oh, Too good. That is correct. Oh wow, I actually got them all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, cool, now that was fun. That was really good, good to engage. Um, next up, debug 101, extinguishing the fire. I use GIFs a lot, is, uh, I don't know if you guys like GIFs, but um, this is IT crowd, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, so debug mode is useful for troubleshooting more in-depth issues with our JSS and or database. Um, usually debug will be enabled for more involving issues such as uh, an inconsistent JSS stability, um, communication or database issues or even a fire. Um, probably wouldn't help you out much there. Um, so look, not many of you guys may know this. Um, the JSS has a hidden login page where we can view the Jamf software server log within a web browser. Um, this can be accessed by appending login.html to your JSS URL in a web browser, like the example shown up on the screen along the top there. So from here, you can check the box to enable debug mode with statement logging, as well as view the last 2,000 lines of the server log and download a full log uh, locally. Um, it, it's worth noting, so if we restart Tomcat at any point, debug mode will be disabled. Um, in the screenshot above, we can see an excerpt of our server log um, in regular login mode. So let's see what happens when we enable debug. Okay, so it's enabled, it's hard to tell, but we're gonna start seeing new entries populating the log pretty quickly. Um, they're identified by the debug flag, so just down the bottom there. Um, these entries will chronicle nearly everything that's going on with the web app. So debug should never be enabled by default. Um, it places additional strain on our server, has a tendency to fill up our logs in a short amount of time, 
making general log analysis much more difficult. Um, the JSS also has a hard limit of 100 meg per log, and up to 10 separate logs will be stored in our server at one time. So we can also enable HTTP debug when required. Um, it'll show HTTP calls and responses for services such as VPP and DEP. So it's generally only enabled on a, a per case basis, depending on the support specialist recommendations. So you might run into that one. Cool. So now we've gone through logs, what are we looking for? Um, there are three main types of entries we'll find in the Jamf software server log. First one, warn. Okay. <laughs> That obviously means warning, guys. Um, warnings can almost, for all intents and purposes, be viewed as an amber light, so your traffic lights. Um, they're generally innocuous, and ignoring these can usually reduce the amount of time we spend troubleshooting on an error. Speaking of which, errors. OK, so they're what we're commonly concerned about when analyzing the Jamf software server log. So these are our stop lights. Um, they'll either be straightforward or super ambiguous. Um, either way, a support specialist will be able to point you in the right direction. And finally, fatal. So it's not too common. Um, essentially, the service has stopped and cannot proceed. Again, uh, best to contact Jamf support if you ever encounter these entries. Cool. Now let's go through some common errors. Uh, it's probably uh, one of the resolutions you guys provide your customers. <laughs> I don't know, I have. Um, <laughs> so common errors, unable to connect to APN server. So essentially, our server is unable to contact the Apple push notification service over port 2195. Um, this needs to be opened up so interaction can take place. Error performing iTunes API search. So generally, if we see the iTunes API lookup errors when attempting to add an app from the App Store catalog, it's generally the result of no connectivity to iTunes over port 80. Um, the most common causes are proxy interferences. Now, I don't know if Matt went through that in the, the session earlier. Uh, <laughs> yeah, awesome. That's good. A little bit is better than nothing, right? So. Uh, last one, exception in thread. Um, Tomcat, out of memory. Uh, sounds like me on a Monday morning, to be honest, but this one is as self-explanatory as they get. We don't have enough memory allocated to Tomcat, and as a result, are likely seeing instability and timeouts with the web app. Cool. So, iOS login. It's pretty, isn't it? <laughs> um, we can use Apple Configurator 2 to capture iOS logs for troubleshooting issues um, relating to app distribution, APNS, communication, and more. Uh, how many of you guys use Apple Configurator 2? Cool. Nice. OK. Um, now, how many of you guys prefer Apple Configurator 1? Right. <laughs> I, was, I was expecting that. Cool. Um, any of you guys used it to capture iOS logs? Few few hands, that's good. Well, I'm going to show you guys anyway. Um, who's captured iOS logs, actually, just in general? Yeah. Um, what would you normally use? Um, there's a, a app called iOS console. Lemon jar? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, awesome. Well, we can now do it in Apple Configurator too. So Apple have uh, given us the, the good grace. Cool. So first, um, we'll open up Apple Configurator too because we can't really get anywhere without that. Um, next. We're going to connect our iOS device via USB. Um, providing that it trusts the host, it should show up in Apple Configurator as a big, shiny iOS device. Uh, once available, double click on the device. It's not the best uh, way to show you, but on the left-hand side, we can select console to view the current logs. Uh, little arrow there. Um, we can also clear these to commence a clean log from a certain point, which is pretty useful for troubleshooting if you're trying to look for a specific error. Um, we can also select reload if we want the previously cleared data back, um, mark a point in the log for better visibility, and we can also save to export the log, which is great for you know, sending through to Jamf support if you need to. Great, so um, I've spoken a lot about logs, uh, what's in them, what we can find, but how do we view them? All right, so we can view logs with a variety of tools from native built-in to third-party apps. 
all Macs out of the box can read a log generated by OS X or the JSS. So we can use terminal to tail, uh, text edit to open logs, and even preview is able to view a log, but I don't recommend that because it's pretty slow, especially with the, the larger Jamf software server logs. Um, by default, a log file will open up in console. Um, that's the native login app for OS X. But if we want to enrich our log viewing experience, uh, which is about as exciting as it sounds, uh, we have a plethora of options online. Uh, generally, any rich text editor will work, but um, some are more focused towards reading logs. One example I recommend is Text Wrangler. Well, I just want to see if there's any questions on login before we continue. I know it's, like, it's not really the most exciting thing ever, but I'm all ears. No, that's fine. We can continue. I've got a question. Oh, you do? Any um, customers using uh, Splunk Lab, I think they can do it. Like a syslog? Um, I haven't encountered any, but we do support that. So if that's something you're looking into, definitely hit us up and we can uh, run through that with you. Anything else? Cool. Avoiding icebergs. So we struck the iceberg before, but you know. Um, let's avoid it so we can focus on getting things done. Um, look, some issues are unavoidable. Uh, just ask the captain of the Titanic too soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But with some preventative maintenance, maybe our JSS can be unsinkable. Health check, sad finder. Nobody likes a sad server, so it's important that we scale and maintain as we expand. Uh, we should run periodic checks to ensure that we have plenty of memory, disk space, and other services aren't running rogue. So, Jamf help check utility. Um, so this is actually a pretty recent thing. Uh, it's a lightweight tool for, for customers to run inside their environments to perform an automated scan of their JSS settings. Um, it checks for scalability and workflow concerns, such as having too little memory, expiring certificates and tokens, or a problematic script. Um, it's publicly available on the Jamf GitHub page for JSS admins to freely use. That is up the top there if you want to take that down. Um, grab it, download it, run it against your JSS. Might be a surprise with what you find. Um, so you simply provide the tool, your JSS URL, username, password, and optionally a MySQL username and password. Um, just to let you know it's completely local. It doesn't talk to J Jamf at all, so you know, your credentials aren't going out to an another country. Um, it then we'll display a report to the end user, similar to what we see on the right-hand side. So um, we've got a cool little things there, uh, system info, database health, uh, if you provide MySQL information. Um, but it's, it's good. Like, it's, um, it's sort of designed as a supplemental tool to, to general troubleshooting and optimization, um, not really as a, a standalone fix-all app. And as it is Java-based, it runs cross-platform on Mac, Windows, Linux. Um, Linux is a command line interface because we don't have the GUI there. Um, but yeah, it's pretty neat, and it is free, so grab it. Cool, all right, so let's talk databases. Um, here's a strip by author XKCD. Um, it's not totally relevant, but it's good for a laugh, and I'll read it out. So, hi, this is your son's school. We're, we're having some computer trouble. Oh, dear, did he break something? In a way. Did you really name your son Robert Drop Tables Table Students? <laughs> oh yes, Little Bobby Tables we call him. <laughs> well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. <laughs> so the JSS uses MySQL as its database technology, and MyISM is the storage engine. MySQL 5.5 and 5.6 are officially supported, um, the latter being the recommended release. 5.7, uh, I'm not sure, is that fully supported at this point? No, okay, I got some, some head shakes there. <laughs> cool, uh, let's go for some common issues. Yeah, it's pretty funny, right? <laughs> okay, so um, corrupt tables. Um, even though my ISM table format is very reliable, any of the following can cause corruption. So MySQL process being killed during a write, uh, unexpected computer shutdown occurs, and a hardware failure, so a hard drive failing, that, that can definitely cause um, corruption to your database. So these are all things to keep in mind. Um, excessive size, so large tables are often the result of our log flushing frequency, 
how we collect inventory and how often. Um, having large tables in our database can vastly impact both performance and stability. Um, scheduled log flushing is a necessary maintenance step to ensure that our database size does not grow exponentially. We can actually set log flushing um, in the JSS by going to settings, uh, system settings, then log flushing. And from here, we can set the frequency. We can manually flush. It's all really good stuff. Um, just to note, the logs mention their history reports utilized by the JSS. They are different to the logs that we just discussed earlier. So um, not to get them confused, I know they're both called logs. Next, uh, table level logs. So if we ever run a MySQL show process list, um, see a whole lot of waiting for table level lock messages, don't panic. This is expected behavior for MySQL. Uh, however, if we find this um, behavior more frequent and our JSS performance is being impacted, then it could be a result of poor optimization, resourcing, um, or an issue with our workflow. So there are a lot of variables concerned here. Um, it's best to contact Jam support so we can have a closer look and determine the cause. Schema changes. So when we upgrade the JSS, Often there's changes to the database schema. So whether it's the addition of a new table, uh, the deprecation of an old, there's times where this process can become unstuck. Uh, after an upgrade, if we're ever presented with a startup suspended message, I don't know if you guys have seen that before, but um, call Jam support, we'll get it all sorted out for you. And finally, fail backups. It goes without saying, database backups are an incredibly important aspect of our JSS environment. Um, common causes for failed backups include previously mentioned large or corrupt tables, so those top two. Um, no space on the server we're writing to, that can be a big issue. Um, incorrect permission to perform the backup command, so if we don't have access to write to SQL. Um, or permissions on the destination itself, make sure you can write to where you're trying to save to. Whoa, back it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all agree that having backups is one of the most important aspects in the IT world. Uh, this applies just as much to our JSS database. Let's avoid having our server fall apart like that golf. Um, I'll take you through the JSS database utility. So who's used it? Yeah, I, I, I imagine a lot of you guys have. So um, yeah, we can use the database utility to backup and restore our database. In addition to this, we can schedule backups, um, make changes to Tomcat and MySQL, um, just the settings, so scaling out. Before creating a backup, the database utility uses the native MySQL binaries to perform a check, um, an optimize and a repair of all tables. Uh, because backing up a corrupt database is pretty counterproductive, right? We don't really want a corrupt database backup. It's essentially useless. Um, if the repair and optimize fails on any tables, whether it be uh, due to corruption or size, the backup will fail. Um, we can actually check our backup status in the database backup log. Uh, it sits under JSS logs um, on our server, so it's dependent on obviously which install you have. But it'll give us a full rundown on any tables which have failed to be repaired. Uh, there's also commands available to run the steps manually because it does just use a native SQL binary. Um, we can run them ourselves in terminal if we like. If you don't want to use the utility, that is fine. Um, we can find this stuff on Jamf Nation. We actually have a KB article. I would link the URL, but it's, I don't think anyone's going to write it down. <laughs> Search it. Um, yeah, it's good. Ah, oh, I forgot which log contains database issues. Can you guys help me out? I'm a bit forgetful. Show of hands. You guys know this. All right, no, that's fine. Dave, don't laugh. <laughs> no, you don't know it? Uh, a lot of them probably, but, uh, it's what, What's the big one? Server yeah, perfect. No, it's good. Um, it's better just to ask you guys than tell you. So, oh, you get some swag as well. There you go. Um, cool. So that sort of concludes my session. Um, do you have any questions about anything I've discussed? I'd, you know, I'd love to answer them. All right. Questions for, questions for Barry as well. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you can take my uh, little mic here. Yeah, the, the handheld one. 
Okay, sure. Even better. What's the, what's the number one support issue you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, You're allowed to talk about that. Have a hack. Oh, look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have, no, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it really depends. Um, like, education customers really like VPP, so we tend to find um, a lot of sort of the VPP issues to be one of the, the main things. Um, MDM, pushing out to iOS devices, stuff like that. APNS related. Yeah. Especially with the complexity of the, the networks. Uh, as you probably know, in a university, you have many segments, different teams looking at the firewall, load balancer, proxy, you name it. It's just getting everyone to get on the same page and that, you know, yeah. opening up those ports. We understand there's also a lot of red tape when it comes to the proxies and uh, getting around all that. Yeah. Um, anything else? Matthew, you had a yeah? question? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll get you to repeat that if that's all right, just so we can uh, get it recorded. But I, I think John's going to be able to answer that one well. Right. Shall I repeat myself? Yep, yep. Uh, I was just asking, uh, have you ever looked at a JSS database and gone, hmm, that's a bit large. What is that size for you? 100 gig. 100 gig. See, it's straight from engineering. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, to, in all honesty, I think it depends on the size of your environment as well. Definitely. Like, if you have only a 50 max, managing 50 max, and your database is, what, 50 gigs, there's something surely wrong there. It should not be that big. What so. you It's actually a really good question. The question was, what did we get the database down to? And it, there, there was a business challenge, and it was actually an education customer, and it had to do with logs. And somewhere, somebody had said, we are not going to get rid of any of our logs for the whole school year, because if Joey got gum on his iPad in November, we want to know about it. And we're like, that's making your database very large, your JSS very slow. So uh, it actually turned into a lot of back and forth. Um, and I think they finished the school year probably closer to 105 gig. And we're going to see what we can do um, when we go into the new school year. So it, it, there was a business case there. But yeah. Rich? Thanks, Chris. Guy. Thanks, Chris. Guy. I thought we had two of these. <laughs> is this, this is a joke to make me run, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> What's the other like? So for. Um, if you have a mandate from your workplace that you do have to maintain all your logs, but you do want to have regular log flushing, what is the best way to go about that? Like a syslog server or some other similar solution? Syslog server is probably one of the main things I would recommend. Um, I don't know if John or Dan, you have any other recommendations on that? It's, it depends. Some logs are um, it, well, as Matt just said there, so it does depend on the logs. If you're saying all logs entirely, you mean your change management log is built in to go to a syslog server. You've got your other uh, database log. You've got your Jam software server log. I got that right? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, I've seen one organization where they were doing something tricky with, they were doing some rsync appending where they were actually sort of extracting out and dumping it onto another directory so that the main, the main problem was not keeping it for that long is because they were only had a very small root drive for their JSS and they were worried that that was going to fill it up. Also something to be aware of, especially if you're doing this in a virtualized host. Um, so they had that sort of offshooting each time and then it would just depend down to a really, really big file. At the end of the day, though, it, I just described it to them as a phone book. They never actually read it. It was just there in case they needed it. And, and that's what it comes down to the logs is really, you, you, you need them, you, well, you, you, you wish you had them when you, you need them and you wish you didn't have them when you didn't need them. Um, yeah, please. Yeah, the, it, it was interesting because the, there was a philosophical, in, in this case there was a f philosophical debate going on. It was kind of, have you ever needed them? And they're like, no, but we might. So it was kind of a newer customer, they weren't 
they were still trying to figure out some processes. So you've got the business case, and we can, you know, we can work with them to educate them. Here's what you can get. Here's what you can't get. The second part of it too is to work with the organization to say, are they are they running Splunk? Uh, and again, in, in commercial, this is more common. They may already have some sort of a system in place. So then it becomes a how can we leverage that system uh, to take that offload out of the logs and whatnot to keep the keep Casper Suite going. Then they've got them in their repository. And the education environment can be a little more complicated because IT may not have the resources for those sorts of tools as well. So then it's, um, there, there are a lot of different things we've tried. We're like, you know, we could do a backup. Uh, let's just back up your database. We'll set it aside. If we need to come back in time, we will. We'll help you with that. Um, so every situation is a little bit unique that way as well. I'm just going to be a runner. Oh, cool. I think we've got time for probably that one more question. Yeah, one last one. Anyone? I was feeling bad for Chris Kerr running, so I thought I'd help. I think Dave also might have had one, but somewhere at the back, right at the back. Go, Dan, go. We'll have to wrap up after this one. Yeah. Uh, my question, oh, sorry, my response to the database uh, question. There is a, if you're comfortable with um, uh, poking around uh, MySQL, there is a command you can actually run on the MySQL database to actually um, report out what um, each uh, table size and, and things yep, um, that definitely. will give you a sort of a hint or a clue where your where your your or your size is um, from smallest to largest that sort of thing. Yeah. If you if you want to poke around for us, uh, it's our uh, package content table, which is the most largest because we do a lot of uninstalls and stuff. So. Yeah, um, and it's also worth mentioning. Sorry, to cut you off. Um, the JSS summary will also output that information. I don't know if you guys have created one before. Yeah. So yeah, it'll basically do the same thing. So that's really handy. Yep. Uh, the other thing was um, with the logs, uh, the automatic flushing of logs, uh, for instance, the policy logs that are automatically flushed, they say if you have a frequency set to one week, yep. does that actually mean that a policy will then, re uh, will then sorry, will redeploy to a machine that's already run that policy? No, it, it will leave the last record, um, to my knowledge, so it will not rerun that policy again. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Cool. So, thank you. Uh, that's our office in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Just a nice little picture there. Um, great. I really appreciate everyone sitting in and listening, and thank you, and you enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>